Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is a frontline update for the 21st of February 2023. The activity that happened pretty much yesterday now, of course. Um, so before we go to discuss uh, the Northeast sector is our first port of call. Actually, it's a few points of discussion. Um, the Russian, this is from the ISW, discussion points at the beginning of their daily report. The Russian military command has likely cut off Wagner Group financier Yevgeny Prigozhin's independent access to artillery shells and heavy weaponry as part of the effort to professionalize Russian conventional forces. This is a schism between the mercenaries and the conventional forces. We've seen arguments on, on video footage between the two on the ground. We know that the MOD is not as disallowed the mention of Wagner PMC in Russian media uh, and Prigozhin is having this protracted argument with, with the conventional forces and the command structure within the Kremlin and the Russian MID. Uh, Prigozhin's appeal may have, been may have misrepresented the devastating impact of the lack of artillery ammunition on Wagner to mask his true frustra frustrations with Wagner's inability to have and operate its own artillery systems independent of conventional Russian units. So complaining about not getting that artillery ammunition, and we've seen videos of Wagner troops saying that they have no, no supplies, no artillery ammunition, could be his way of saying, look, we need to operate our own independent artillery, not rely on Russian forces because of you know, that, that schism. Uh, that has taken place. We know that, interestingly, so mortar artillery, mortar is incredibly important in these kind of urban fighting environments. Uh, the claim is that, and I think reporting from Ukraine were talking about this, the claim is that Solidar, one of the reasons the Ukrainians lost Solidar in the way they did is that they had a lack of mortar support, mortar fire. That when, when you have these urban scenarios, you need that close support of, of some heavy hitting but you might not be able to get tanks in there and communicating with artillery fire and having artillery fire be accurate enough and all this kind of stuff is quite difficult. So mortars are really effective for just popping up those shots because they're embedded with the people who are doing the fighting, you know, either defensively or offensively. So mortars are super important. And one of the reasons apparently that Ukrainians uh, struggled in Solidar was their lack of um, mortar. Uh, fire. So the, the other thing that's worthy of note before we go to that particular bit of front line in the Northeast is that according to ISW, former Russian officer and prominent mill blogger Igor, Igor Gherkin claimed on February 19th that Russian forces crossed the border into Kharkiv Oblast from Russia. Russian troops already occupied part of Kharkiv from, from Luhansk Oblast and occupied one or two unspecified border settlements. Gherkin claimed that skirmishes between Ukrainian and Russian forces along the border of Sumy Oblast intensified. So let's go and put this on the war mapper map. So in the Sumy area, uh, fighting is intensifying there, and perhaps incursions across the border, but it's fairly unspecified, somewhere in the Kharkiv Oblast. So Kharkiv goes, uh, just to let you know, oops, no it doesn't. If I can press my my fingers, can press correctly. Uh, you have the Luhansk Oblast there coming down, um, and the Kharkiv Oblast looks like it goes like that. Um, so yeah, so you'll have somewhere along here, according to Igor Gherkin, there is uh, Russian troops have been. Uh, doing some incursions. Anyway, to uh, continue, let's go uh, and talk about the Kupiansk to Svatova to Kremlin sector, that axis there, and we'll go to the uh, to my map to just north of Kupiansk to Liman Pershi and Dvorichne and Hreni Kivka, which is this settlement that has been uh, taken by, captured by the Russians. So, uh, a Russian mill blogger claimed that Russian forces are conducting successful offensive operations in the Kupiansk direction, despite their slow pace, and Ukrainian forces announced civilian evacuations in Kupiansk in anticipation of surrendering the settlement. We've heard this a few times. Could well be the case. I mean, I wouldn't want to live in Kupiansk, given that there could well be a large offensive brewing. Uh, we know that generally when it comes to evacuation, the most vulnerable are the last to leave, the elderly and the infirm. Uh, so it's often quite difficult for them to leave, uh, not having the money, the, the, the support or the wherewithal to do so. Um, anyway, as we come further down south, there have been some rumours 
uh, and and I can't really confirm this, but that the Ukrainians have done a counterattack south of Kuzmivka, may have taken Krivoshivka and Pidkuichansk, which they'd previously held. That's kind of a bit of ebbs, ebbs and flow around here. Uh, ebbs and flows. So Andrew Perpetua said there were rumours of Ukrainian advance near Svatova today. I continue to seek out confirmation such an attack in advance. I only hear reputations. I'm not told such an attack uh, occurred and they are maintaining their defensive line. It seemed plausible, blah, blah, blah. So there's talk there about w how that could be happening. Uh, one saying that actually that, that would be interesting because the Russians are pushing north of Svatova uh, um, and uh, for you know even further north so if they are if they're hitting down closer to Svatova in a in a counterattack that could be an interesting development but there's no real confirmation of that I'll be warned uh and uh we come on further further down south let's go back to ISW see what they have to say Russian forces uh, continued ground assaults near Kremlin uh, on the 19th and 20th usual sort of Names, Chivona Papivka, Belarivka. Geolocated footage posted on the 19th shows that Russian forces have made marginal advances near Torska, 15 kilometers west of Kremina. Now, I, I'm not 100% sure about this. So the geolocated footage is this. It's of um, shelling of uh, an area just here. I don't think that does show advances because that shelling is within Ukrainian lines and it I don't think it shows anything particularly other than the Russians are shelling there. So I disagree with ISW that actually shows that there's advances, but there might be advances in the area. A Russian mail blogger claimed on February the 19th that Russian airborne forces, VDV, comprised the main strike force near Kremina. Um, and there's a bit of conversation here. It's unclear if the VDV forces are reinforcing or relieving elements of the 144th Motorized Division uh, that have been engaged in motorized rifle division that have been engaged in decisive offensive operations on the axis since early January and may be at or near culmination. So, yeah, don't know for sure if they, if they are culminating around there. A military blogger claimed on February the 20th that Russian forces tried to advance near Bilirivka and Makivka and attacked near Hryorivka and Zarichna. OK, so let's put that on the map. What's that saying? So... There are attacks near Makivka, which is uh, further up there. Uh, as we come down the Kherovets River down here, uh, there was talk there about Bilirivka and indeed a place called Kriorivka. <laughs> and that would be interesting. There's attacks near there because actually there are claims that the Russian that the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back a little bit in the in this forested area. So this kind of near it does a lot of heavy lifting. Could that be in the direction fighting south? Could there be some forces around this area that are pushing south? I don't know. But I, I've I've adapted my maps a little bit and pushed the Russians back a tiny bit in the forested area, but it's just intense fighting and not a crazy amount of detail coming out from there. Uh, as you can see, Rebar goes straight on to talk about Bakhmut. Uh, we go to Defmon, who's now doing reports again. In this area, the Ukrainians are repulsing an attack in the area of Bilirivka. No significant change in, in this over the last few days. The only interesting thing is that Reba think that Bilirivka is controlled by the Russians. And uh, it's clearly not, as according to, uh, to uh, Defmon. Now, uh, Serhii Haidai has said that Ukrainian defenders in the Kremlin direction hold the defence and sometimes go into a counterattack and fight back. And this is concerning that sort of uh, area around Kremlin, maybe that forest, forested area itself. Now, uh, Kenneth Gregg, Swedish fighter who's in, um, in Ukraine, often does these updates, take this with a pinch of salt, but does say some stuff about Kremlin. Um, uh, things are starting to happen south of Kremlin, but the enemy and we have carried out an offensive south of Kuzimivka, or I think that's Kuzimirna, sorry. Uh, but we are a little further south than they, but at the same time, uh, the enemy advanced a few hundred metres, while we, in turn, two kilometres. We are currently attacking their 13th Squad Bars units. That's a re reserve unit. If the operation fully succeeds, we will flank their 237th Airborne Assault Regiment and their 234th Airborne Regiment, whereby Kremlin is threatened. Um, too early to shout hooray, but at least the enemy will soon have a lot to think about, and my claims that they are stopped here are soon being cemented. 
this is very interesting so it could be i i i don't know exactly what that's going to look like uh but it could be that the uh, russians are are making advances around there and maybe the uh, sorry oops so let's do that again the russians might be making advances around there and i'm kind of making this up but just to give you the idea of, of what that could look like and ukrainians are sort of making advances up here and they hope to get you know nearer ukraine or uh, sorry kremlin or something something along along those lines but this is quite a large area and you can imagine certain units doing well in one place while others are uh are suffering in another place or and vice versa um so yeah they there could be uh, there is interesting activity going on there and that would support what Sergei Haidai has said that that there are counterattacks taking place so it, it could be worth worth you know believing that to some extent um, and then we come down to Bakhmut, and it's all about. So, although there will be um, repelled attacks going on in all these sort of places, and when you look at the ISW account, it's you know all the usual places: Vazikivka, Bakivka, Vazilivka, Fedorivka, um, uh, Vimka, uh, so on and so forth. So, these are all these sort of uh, places: Fedorivka, there. Um, uh, you've got Bakivka. And we're going to come on to talk about Yahidne. And then as we zoom in, there are uh, Vazio Kivka, uh, so on and so forth. So all, all these sort of places under under pressure, but it's about Bakivka and Yahidne. So there are claims that Yahidne has been taken. So here this is like referring actually to ISW maps. But remember, the ISW maps talk about so the yellow for the isw so based on these kind of claims that we see in the isw they produce maps and they produce on their interactive map which is actually a pretty decent map they the the red areas are are what they assess as definite russian control and the yellow areas are claimed control from different russian sources so that's to say that not Yahidni is fully under control. That's part of Yahidni, a Russian source has claimed it controls. Now, I would say that Yahidni is is looking endangered. Um, Suryat Maps, pro-Russian mapper, says uh, the Russian army has continued advancing south of Stupka Station and managed to enter the Yahidni. However, it's premature to say the village was taken by the uh, as the Ukrainian army is still in control of the adjacent hill. And here's their map. So here the Ukrainians are still in control here and it looks like they are pushing back as well uh, in the Stubica sort of area. So the Yahidne is this sort of um, this village more to the west of the suburb of Bakhmut. So if you put that into the context of my map here, you've got northern Bakhmut and then you have this Stubica area, this suburb, which is being gradually taken by the Russians. Uh, well, I said gradually, it's been fairly quick over the last few days. And and then Yahidni is really threatened. Well, it appears that the Russians do have some presence in Yahidni. Uh, but uh, it could be that the Ukrainians are counterattacking there as well. Uh, Kenneth Runt says of Bakhmut, uh, also at Yahidni, we have pushed their spearhead back 800 metres, while they in turn have advanced 600 metres northwest of Yahidni. So that's to say, I think that the, that represents the Syriac map here, which is to say the, Ru the Ukrainians could be pushing the Russians back along the Stupka sort of area, while northwest here, the Russians are are coming down and having more success there. But um, but again, you know, I await sort of confirmation of this. Uh, as we have counterattacked and averted the immediate threat to the community, we have become more active here too, which in turn bodes well. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about Abdivka. So that's as much he says about um, Bakhmut. No report said last night it will be a long and difficult night for Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut. The intensity of the fighting in the area is really extremely extreme right now. Russia wants to force a breakthrough at all costs, but this comes with uh, unbelievable losses. In my opinion, the next days will be decisive. Defmon says, uh, basically, last week the Russians captured Paris Kavivka and Krasnohora. The situation on the north side of Bakhmut is deteriorating for the AFU and the Ukrainian army. Withdrawal from Bakhmut is coming closer and closer. The Russians have set a goal to capture Bakhmut by February the 24th, but it's unlikely they will achieve their goal. I agree. Uh, 
I will say that I really think the Russians are throwing the kitchen sink at Bakhmut probably right now. I, I pro- my guess is that they really would like to say something significant on the 24th. So that basically gives them two to three days to do or three days to do as much as they possibly can, particularly in the north here. So even if they're struggling a little bit down the south at the moment, even if there's been some pushback from the Ukrainians, if they can if they can march into the north of Bakhmut, m- that might be enough to say, hey, look, we, it looks like we're going to take Bakhmut. Yay, success after a year. You know, we've taken the northern suburbs of a small town in the east of Ukraine. Because uh, remember, let's get this into perspective, right? Bakhmut is that tiny little uh, town there. That is one tiny place in the whole of Ukraine. So if they sing about the success of Bakhmut after that many months, it kind of tells you where the Russian army are at the moment. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, um, as far as Rebar says, on the northern out uh, Bakhmut, so Russian forces continue an operation to encircle Bakhmut in the northern and southern flanks. The enemy's deeply entrenched defences are being crushed by heavy artillery fire and onslaught of assault units. Go on, when I used to teach English, this would be... Um, to be using emotive language because you're doing persuasive writing, right? So what are you trying to persuade people about here? It's an audience purpose task. Uh, anyway, I don't want to side sidebar there. Um, on the northern outskirts, units of Wagner PMC broke through the Ukrainian defense and advanced to the outskirts of Yahidny, as we've seen. On, at the same time, Russian troops penetrated deeper into defense of Ukrainian formations near Stukki Station. Uh, southwest Russian assault units are fighting on the outskirts of Krasna and Budanivka area. Uh, so these are two names we might not have seen before. Advancing forces are supported by barrel and rocket artillery and aviation. OK, let's have a little look at that. So just to let you know where Rebar say uh, these areas are, Krasna and uh, what, was, uh, what was the other one? Krasna and... Budinivka area. As far as I can work out, the Krasna area is part of Ivanivka, and I think Budinivka might be sort of part of the Bakhmut area somewhere around this southern area there. But uh, their video is interesting. So it says Krasna there. This is Ivanivka, uh, and they have their front. Um, Rebar have their front line, the Russian front line, much closer to the highway that I and other mappers have. I think they've been uh, forced back from the highway and they're still back here. But Rebar have them all the way up here and really uh, putting pressure on uh, even Iska as a whole, as you can see there. Uh, but interestingly, if you go to the east of, of the city, they they talk about Vatuna, uh, Vatutina Lane being under pressure but that's actually that uh west east lane there and they they have control russian control much further back and in fact more of a gray zone there they've they have sort of three different colors so it's difficult four different colors or five different colors it's difficult to know exactly what they mean by that but uh at the moment i have my eastern area of bakhmut as per um syriac maps but if you look at deep state map, the Russian lines are actually much further back here, sort of four roads inwards, and the line goes up there. So mine could well be a bit generous to the Russians, and Rebar have the, the definite line back here, but then lots of different colours going, going forward. So it's difficult to know exactly what's going on there. If we uh, look to no reports, no change north and back. OK, yeah, fighting continues northeast of Pekivka. Wagner's have gained some ground south of Paris, Pekivka towards Yahidne. Yeah, Russians have brought a lot of heavy equipment into the area. Southwest, uh, no changes. An attack towards Ivaniska was repulsed. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it appears that it's fairly stable uh, to the south and southwest. Uh, not really sure what's going on in the east. And there is movement of the Russians in the north, but there could be a little bit of a pushback from Ukrainians there. And there might well be uh, more heavy equipment going in from for, for the Russians. OK, let's come further down south to Avdivka and see what we have to say about that. Let's go back to Kenneth Gregg, who talks about this northern area, Kamyanka, around the Kamyanka area, where I said the Russians have 
been uh, showing some advances. They've pushed the Ukrainians back a little bit to the west of the road there. There's also been a lot of activity around Nova Bakhmutivka. Uh, and Kenneth Gregg also talks about the south in uh, Vodjani and Opitny. He says, um, uh, do, 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 north of Kamyanka, we have also become active and counterattacked and advanced 700 meters. This is a front line that has been quiet for a couple of months, so activity by us is welcome. At Opitny and Piski, the enemy now has 13 regiments and brigades, a huge concentration of troops in a narrower area, equal to what they have concentrated around Kremina in an area twice as large. What is going to happen here? Has the enemy been forced to listen to the criticism of the separatists and to accommodate them there? So this is a claim that there's a huge uh, accumulation of troops in this area south of Abdivka. It'd be interesting to see whether that amounts to anything. Defamon makes mention of the Russians capturing Nova Bakhmutivka that happened, uh, that, that I, I told you about and showed uh, on the map. They've captured at least most of that. Uh, no reports goes on to say Marienka Avdivka, the front is stuck, Russian troops lack combat power. Gherkin also confirms this in a message. So Eagle Gherkin, Evil Gherkin, the uh, the the Russian, the pro-Kremlin um voice, uh, although he's quite critical of the Kremlin. I was asked by someone not to use pro-Russian because there are a lot of Russians that don't agree with this. Uh, but it is difficult when you're talking about Russian forces and Ukrainian forces and sources that represent being for those Russian forces, but I get the point. Russian reinforcements are reportedly being brought uh, together in Mariupol and Militopol. A group of 5,000 troops is to reinforce Vukhodar soon to force a breakthrough. So that's interesting claims there as well. Um, Angie Perpetua says, um, I'm sure he's got some stuff. Uh, yeah, he talks about how Russia's throwing everything they have at Bakhmut, hoping to break it now. Because if it if the line stabilizes, it will be much harder for them. They are just pouring in everything at this point. If it fails, who knows what their plan B is? He goes on to talk about fighting near Vodjani and Novelsky is without changes. The heaviest fighting is near Novelsky, where Russia is intending uh, a breakthrough. Uh, although they do not seem to have the numbers required. Russia, although that's interesting because elsewhere we hear that there's a build-up of troops. Uh, Russia may have had minor advances up to a single tree line, perhaps 200 metres or so. So he's talking about Novelsky, which is this tiny little settlement down here, which is very entrenched. There could be some minor advances around there, heavy fighting around there, Pervomysky, uh, Pisky, Vodjanye, and so on. Um, if we go to... Uh, the rebar doesn't say uh, an awful lot. Uh, basically, ends up back moot. Let's go and see what ISW has to say. ISW say Russian mill bloggers emphasize that the situation in Abdivka area is very difficult and has taken on a positional nature due to continued Ukrainian counterattacks and a pervasive exhaustion of troops of the Donetsk People's Republic. And that comes from that footnote is uh, 47. So that comes from Strokov, Igor Strokov, Rebar and another Russian source as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, the usual sort of claims about uh Activity around uh, Nobelsky, Vodjani, and uh, up towards Kamyanka as well. Uh, as we come on down to uh, Marienka, what do we have to say about Marienka? Well, um, no report says that, it, that basically it's stuck there. Andrew Perpetua says around Marienka, the Russian offensive has stalled, no changes. So it appears that that, that might well be the case. You know, all, all that. Um, ISW has to say is that they're discussing purported operations around the western part of Marienka. So, uh, yeah, not a lot to report about Marienka, it, it appears. So then we come on down to Vukladar and the claims around this very active uh, part of the front line. I've uh, now represented the gains, the counteroffensive that the Ukrainians have done all the way down to this um this water feature down there and parts of Mikilska that they've taken back, these datches down here. Uh, the Suryak, the pro-Russian mapper, says Ukrainian-Russian war, day 362, situation at the Vukladar front. During the last five days, Ukrainians have launched a counter-attack and retook the southern outskirts of Vukladar town and part of the uh, Mikilska datches where the Russian army and DPR forces have retreated. So admit that that is the case there. I've represented that in my map as well. Andrew Perpetua says no known changes, has that as a grey area. Uh, but um, no reports talks about, again, the 5,000 troops to reinforce Vukladar. 
uh, there, there is a, a lot of talk about um, troop accumulations in all sorts of places, Mariupol, Melitopol, how, you know, Wagner was sent in 30 whatever busloads to uh, to the Zaporizhia area. So it's trying to second guess what the Russians are planning on doing in the area. Are they going to throw just a load more troops at Vukladar, do the same thing, but hope to overwhelm the Ukrainians just with a mass of people? I don't know. On the flip side, there are some uh, Russian claims. So several uh, several mill bloggers circulated footage on February the 20th reportedly of Ro Russian naval infantry elements storming a Ukrainian trench and engaging small arms fire at point-blank range near Vukladar. A Russian mill blogger noted that the offensive in the area has bogged down despite active actions of the 155th and 338th Guards. Rocket artillery brigade, several Russian f sources emphasized the role of the TOS-1 a thermobaric artillery systems in supporting Russian operations in this sector. We've seen one of them get blown up, but they are pretty nasty bits of kit and they're still active. Here, is, I won't play you this, it's got really loud music. It's not, it doesn't show you all that much, but it is a video of uh, trenches being attacked at close range by uh, Russians and, uh, you, you know, using hand grenades and all sorts, um, saying that they cleared them out, cleared all the Nazis out and all that kind of usual stuff. Uh, so there is there is activity on both sides going on around Vukladar. It's not all uh, going to be all singing, all dancing, successful. The Ukrainians there, there will be tough fighting, you know, all along this front line. And there'll be some areas where the Russians are making having success and some areas where the Ukrainians are. But I think the, the taking of Vukladar by the Russian forces is going to be very difficult. And they, they need to kind of come up with a different uh, different plan than just, you know, attacking it head on and not getting very far. Um, anyway, let's go to look at the rest of Zaporizhia or look at Zaporizhia and Kherson. OK, a couple of interesting things to note uh, on the Zaporizhia front line around Orakhiv. So first of all, uh, is it Nova and uh, Nova Danilivka? Is that where there was some uh, localized attacks in yeah, Nova Danilivka? But then Ukrainian Maripol mayoral advisor stated on February the 20th that Russian forces are concentrating uh, forces near Orokhiv and will likely deploy rough, roughly 15 battalion tactical groups worth of personnel in the area by February the 24th. In Robert Turner, uh, Piatikatsky, and Nova Pokrivka. Uh, so that that is interesting. So that some uh, skirmishes taking place there, but then in the area, uh, Nova Pokrivka and uh, other places, there is uh, perhaps as a uh, Robert uh, Robert Turner, and uh, it depends if you have the Russian uh, spelling or the Ukrainian spelling. But there are places around here where there could be a huge accumulation of troops and so is the question then is as ever is that for a defensive posture or for a, a russian attack are the russians attacking there because they they suspect there could be a ukrainian attack there in the late spring i don't know so if, if they get in there first that could ruin the ukrainian plans and you know the best form of defense is attack type thing uh so if the russians were to attack there that might stop the ukrainians from being able to do a later attack down uh down in the same place through to melitopol or maybe through to mariupol or, or what have you so it could be that that the Russians decide that that this could be a good time to do their attacks both in the Vukhladar area and in the Orokiv area and then move up in, in that way as a form of actually defending this area from future counterattacks, uh, gain some ground. And because, of course, they want the Donbass, which, you know, goes up from there. And so they, they need this, uh, you know, if they want to fulfill Putin's demands they they need Vukladar they need that area there so uh, you might see a counter or an attack in Vukladar you might see an attack in Orokhiv it's just trying to work out whether because you know as RSW says here we're trying to work out whether the Ukrainian claims are, tr are true RSW has not observed Russian forces recently concentrating forces in the Orokhiv area so you know that might not definitely be true. Uh, anyway, that's your frontline update. Not a lot in the Kherson area to report on. Um, usual hits behind the lines uh, of HIMARS, but the 
desperate calls for longer range munitions uh, are are being sounded the whole time. Interesting that Putin had something to say on the range of uh, munitions today in his speech. I know it's a bit yeah. odd for a frontline update, but I I am going to uh, play you this. The responsibility for starting the conflict for growing number of victims lies totally with the West and with Kiev regime, for whom Ukrainian people are not their own, effectively. Th this regime is not serving their national interests. They're serving interests of foreign powers. The uh, Ukraine is, is now like a training ground for them. Um, I'm not going to talk about the plans of Western powers to increase military aid. Everyone knows about this. But one thing is is uh, very clear to everyone. The, the greater the range of these uh, systems, the further away we will be forced to move the threat from our borders. That was a big one there. I hopefully you heard that. The greater the range of these systems, so you use longer range missiles, we're going to have to use, move the threat, your threat, further away from our borders. So I think that that's an interesting counter to what I see as the demand for Ukraine and the willingness of the West to provide long range uh, munitions. Anyway, uh, that's Frontline Update. Thank you so much. Please like, subscribe and share. Um, thanks for all your support. Thanks to all the members, new and old, uh, here. Really appreciate that. Uh, take care, and I'll speak to you later.